During the day, I put on uh, Gavin Ashenden's um, podcast and he was there talking to Mark and Catherine about uh, the story, different um, stuff in the church. And he mentioned on Bishop Barron's intervention, the, the recent letter. And I just thought it'd be good if I could read it out and just, you know, get it a wide, wider distribution because Bishop Barron is really making some interesting points. The strange thing is when I finished watching this video, another video popped up and it was from the Church of England and they were making an intervention in the Church of England. And I think all Catholics should actually listen to it what is being said in the church of england because this is where us catholics could head to we could be <laughs> i don't i don't think so but like we could be just telling catholics you can do act against sacred scripture but anyway just listen to this video because i thought it was very 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 important so mr matavu thank you for calling me daniel matavu oxford 379 why is all this so important, people ask? Well, it matters to God, as he has made clear through his word, which thankfully is much easier to comprehend than the 108-page document presented to us by the bishops. If you care to look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 10, you find a list not of the righteous, but of the unrighteous. It includes the sexually immoral, adulterers, and arsenicoitai. Though I read ancient Greek at Oxford, you don't have to be a classic scholar to know what that, the meaning of the term arsenicoitai. It's easy to translate. It literally means male bedders, or as the LLF materials translate it, males who bed together. It is not qualified in any way according to the nature or stability of the relationship. So it covers any male who sleeps with another male. Of such males, God's word does not say that God will bless their union. It does not say that God will bless the goods or fruits of their relationship, provided it is stable, faithful, and committed nor even that God will make pastoral provision for them without requiring them to repent. No, nothing of the sort. What the word of God does say is that these persons, males who sleep with other males, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not my words, God's word. Now that's a very big deal. Nobody in this chamber should doubt the seriousness of those consequences. The 44 bishops will correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the mission of the church was to encourage people to get into the kingdom of heaven, not help them get disqualified from it. I believe that the bishops' proposals are contrary to and wholly inconsistent with God's word. I'm shocked at the lack of transparency, lack of integrity, lack of proper process in accordance with the canons. For these reasons, I cannot support this motion. Thank you. So, I mean, that was a, an intervention from the Church of England and they just spelt it out. You know, we have sacred scripture, which gives some clear teachings on how we are supposed to act as Christians. You know, you don't leave your wife and go off with another woman and have a relationship. You know, men do not sleep with men, you know, and I, and I know this is controversial in today's world, but as Christians, there are teachings in, in, the, in the Bible. You know, and Christ didn't come to abolish the law, but to, you know, and, you know, we when I when we try to evangelize, we're not giving our own perspective. We're not giving our own truth. We're giving a truth that's been has, handed on to people and we have to love people in truth. Never hate them. You know, we are born male and female. That's a truth we have to accept as as Christians in our in our Christian communities. Now, of course, you know, people come to the church and they have their difficulties and we, we fall, we sin, etc., etc. But if we don't have the guiding truth to look to, we are lost. 
We are literally lost as, as, as Catholics. If we don't have a truth to look to, in which to lead people to, to strengthen people in, we are lost. And I, this discussion that's been going on over the last while, I found it very problematic. And so have many other people. That's putting it mildly. Because we have to preach and teach and live the truth, or try to, in order to, to give people access to the truth. And not a scientifically inspired remodelation of interpretation and so forth that, you know, really isn't isn't the, the, the gospel truth, isn't what the what are what we have believed to be the faith and morals of the church for the last two thousand years and before. Anyway, just gonna read you through Bishop Barron's um just going to read you through Bishop Barron's document because I do think everybody should hear it. He's calling for the church to resist what the German bishops are doing. Hello. He's not the only bishop actually. We've, there's a number of bishops saying the same thing. You know, the church, the, the German bishops are leading their church into schism. Leading, saying there is no truth. There's nothing in the gospel. There's nothing in sacred scripture that's now tr any longer true. You know, if science evolves in such a way, then we evolve with science. We don't have, we don't, we don't look to our sacred scriptures. We look to science. Oh no, you're made that way. You're going to act that way. You don't need to change. There's no call to conversion. That's it. I mean, we're, what are we teaching? What are we teaching? No, I'm as if somebody that's you know, I've had my own failings, and I'm not. I am a sinner. I don't hold myself up to be anything other than that. You know, I accept the truth. I act in conformity to that truth. I slowly try and offer every day my life to Christ. You know, I have, I, it's a, the act of oblation that we do every day as, as Christians, you know, in the heart of the prayer. And Jeanne speaks about that. You know, we have to do that act of oblation every morning. Lord, I give you my body my past, my future, my sins, my failings, everything I give you so that he can accept our relation and transform our lives. And if we're not able to, to give this beautiful message to the world, we are lost. We are lost. The synod and synodality should be looking to, to repropose the treasures of our church not trying to impose a scientific um, reformulation of our, of our sexual morality. Um, and again, it's, I'm not criticizing the Pope here because I know the Pope has, has said it several times that he's not going to change ch church teaching. He's literally said that. I mean, but there are, there are issues that, that many people are calling out with the synod and need I say more. I'm just a lay blogger. But I, I, I do I do want to get the message that Bishop Aaron is getting out in the in his letter. No, we need to resist. Uh, we need to resist this. Anyway, God bless you. Take care. Bye bye. My experience of the synod by Bishop Robert Barron. Now that I've had a bit of time to readjust to my normal rhythm and to think through the rather extraordinary experience of the last month in Rome, I would like to share some impressions of the Synod on Synodality, even as I will endeavour not to violate the Pope's request that we refrain from talking about the particular participants and votes. So I will limit myself to commenting on the published document that the Synod uh, members approved and on my own interventions during the deliberations. The summary statement very accurately expresses the fact that the overwhelming concern of the Synod members was to listen to the voices of those who have, for a variety of reasons, felt marginalised from the life of the Church. This motif was the common denominator in all the preliminary discussions leading up to the Synod, and it was prominently featured in the working document that provided the basis for our discussions women, the laity in general, the LGBT community, those with disabilities, young people, men and women of colour, etc., have felt unappreciated and, most importantly, excluded from the tables where discussions were, are taken that affect the whole life of the Church. I can assure everyone that their demand to be heard was heard, 
loud and clear at the Synod. And I'm glad it was. The Church is meant to announce the Gospel to everyone. Todos, 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 as the Pope rightly says. And to gather them into the body of Christ. Therefore, if there are armies of Catholics who feel excluded or condescended to, that's a major pastoral problem that must be addressed with humility and honesty. And I can say as somebody who has been a full-time ecclesiastical administrator for the past 12 years, I am delighted to receive the Council of Laity in regard to practising all aspects of my work expanding the number and diversity of those who might aid the bishop the bishops in their governance of the church is all to the good and bravo to the synod for exploring this possibility a question that i raised several times to in the small group conversations however was whether in our enthusiasm to include people in the governments of the church we forget that the vocation of 99% of the catholic laity is to sanctify the world to bring christ into the arenas of politics the arts entertainment communication business medicine etc precisely where they have special competence Generally speaking, I was worried that both the Instrumentum Laboris and the Synod conversations were far more preoccupied with the ad intra than with ad extra. And this despite the fact that Pope Francis has been consistently calling for a church that goes out from itself. On a number of occasions during the Synod, I proposed the Catholic action model that was, in the preconciliar period, such an effective way to form the, la- the laity in their mission to the world. Another principal theme of the Synod discussions was the play or perceived tension between love and truth. On one hand, we must welcome everyone, but least this welcoming devolve into a form of cheap grace, to use Dietrich Bonhoeffer's term. We, at the same time, must summon those we include to conversion, to live according to the truth. As you might suspect, this issue became concretized around the outreach to the LGBT community. Practically everyone at the Synod held that those whose sexual lives are outside the norm should be treated with love and respect. And again, bravo to the Synod for making this pastoral point so emphatically. But many Synod participants also felt that the truth of the Church's moral teaching in regard to sexuality ought never to be set aside. One of the interventions that I made to the Plenary Assembly was on this theme. I observe that when the terms are rightly understood, understood, there is no real tension between love and truth. For love is not a feeling, but the act by which one wills the good of another. Therefore, one cannot authentically love someone unless he has a truthful perception of what is really good for that person. There might, I argued, be a tension between welcoming and truth, but not between authentic love and truth. The third area of interest concern for me centred around the notion of mission. The term mission was used consistently in the text we considered and the conversations we had. That the church is a mission, to use St. Paul VI's uh, language, was taken for granted by Synod members and this represents a significant and very encouraging appropriation of the teaching of Vatican II and of the post-conciliar papal magisterium. Pope John Paul II's undefatigable undef- undef- teaching on the new evangelization has evidently worked its, ha- its way into the heart and mind of the worldwide church. But there was, at least in my mind, a fair amount of ag- ambiguity around the meaning meaning of the word itself, judging that what we read in the Instrumentum Laboris, mission seemed, more often than not, to designate the Church's work in favour of social justice or betterment of the economic and political situation of the poor. Conspicuous by their absence in the texts on mission were references to sin, 
grace, redemption, cross, resurrection, eternal life and salvation. And this represents a real danger for in point of fact, the primary mission of the church is to declare the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to invite people to place themselves under his lordship. This discipleship, to be sure, has implications for the way we live in the world and it certainly should lead us to work for the for justice but we must keep our priorities straight the supernatural should never be reduced to the natural rather the natural order should be transfigured by its relationship to the supernatural order the final point and here i find myself in frank disagreement with the final synodal report has to do with the development of moral teaching in regard to sex this suggestion is made that the advances in our scientific understanding will require a rethinking of sexual teaching, whose categories are apparently inadequate to describe the complexities of human sexuality. A first problem I have with this language is that it is so condescending to the richly articulate tradition of moral reflection in Catholicism, a prime example of which is the theology of the body developed by John Paul II. To say that this multi-layered, philosophically informed, theologically dense system is incapable of handling the subtleties sub of human sexuality is just absurd. The deeper problem I have is that this manage, manner of argumentation is based upon a category error, namely that advances in sciences as such require an evolution of moral teaching. Let us take the example of homosexuality. Evolutionary biology, anthropology and chemistry might give us a fresh insight into the etiology and physiological, physical dimension of the same-sex attraction. But they will not tell us a thing about whether homosexual behaviour is right or wrong. The entertaining of that question belongs to another mode of discourse. It is troubling to see that some of the members of the German Bishops' Conference are already using the language of the Synod Report to justify major reformations of the Church's sexual teaching. This, it seems to me, must be resisted. The very best part of the Synod was, of course, coming in close contact with the Catholic leaders from all over the world. In my various small groups and during the very lively coffee breaks, I met bishops and laity from Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Lithuania, Hong Kong, Germany, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, Australia, Austria and on and on. The four weeks in war, Rome were, was a uniquely privileged opportunity to sense the Catholicity of Christ's body. And like it or not, this kind of encounter changes you compelling you to see that your vision of things is one perspective of many. All of these ideas and experiences from the Synod will continue in the coming year to percolate in the mind of the Church in preparation for the second and final round next October. Might I invite everyone to continue to pray for the work that we Synod members must do both in the interim and at the Vatican next year.